The following presentation was recorded at the Buddhist Society of Victoria, Malvern East, Australia. Please visit our website at bsv.net.au. So today uh, I will do a, a chant as usual, and this is sort of like the mystery quiz. What's the subject going to be? But maybe, maybe you'll get it. I'll do it in Pali and then I can read it in English. So there we are. Mata pintu upata nang puta dara sa sanga ho anakula chakamanta etang mangala mutamang. First of all, the people recognize that. I think. Mahamangala Sutta, yeah, it's a Mangala Sutta. So, and the translation uh, for, uh, for that is support for one's parents, assistance to one's wife and children or partner and children, an honest, uh, this is Bhikkhu Bodhi's translation, or peaceful occupation. This is the highest blessing. This is the Mahamangala Sutta or Mangala Sutta. So it's a guess what it could be, today's talk could be about, but it's actually the last section, which is about our occupations, you know, our livelihood. And this is an important part of the Buddhist path, actually, is right livelihood. And I wanted to talk about this because um, it's part of the, our ethical conduct, part of the section of the Noble Eightfold Path on ethical conduct. And in that section, we've already had, and I've already spoken about this, a right speech and right action. So this is right livelihood. And it's a very important part of all of our lives. It's the um, because most people spend quite a bit of time at work. If they have a job, they'll be spending quite a bit of time at work. And actual fact, uh, some people say more time than they maybe have at home, waking hours. And that can be the case. So it's an important environment for us to practice in. You know, people often um, uh, think of their lives as in, in compartments. We, we compartmentalize our lives. This is work. This is coming to the temple. <laughs> this is, you know, uh, our home life. This is all sports. You know, we have uh, different, different compartments in our lives. And this is um, sort of natural that this happens. But really, for our spiritual practice, we need to integrate all the aspects of our lives with our spiritual practice. And, you know, very much so that, that we find that if something is not really in keeping with our spiritual practices, you know, values we, we uh, subscribe to, values and guidelines that we think are very useful for our life, then it's good to question whether we should be doing that, or, uh, whether it be work or some sporting activity or some, uh, some other activity in our life. Because in very, very real way, the Buddha's teaching is, of course, what's it all about? The mind. The mind. And the mind we take with us all the time. And even though we compartmentalize, and this is work, and this is home, and this is my social life, and this is all the other parts, sports life, or whatever it is, the mind is the same mind we take with us into all those different aspects of our lives. So our job really is to integrate them so they all come together. You know, that, so our values, what we, what we believe in, those things that we feel are good in terms of speech and action and also in terms of how we use our mind, that they inform how we uh, live our life, whether it be at work or at home. And so, as I often say, you hear this many times from me, it's a 24-7 practice. <laughs> So that means 24 hours, seven days a week, because we have our minds with us all the time. And it's not just when we come to the, the temple. People are usually very well behaved at temples, often. <laughs> but this may not be the case when they go to work or they go home. So this is our job, is to integrate all those parts of our lives and those values that are really important for us to live by. Because they are the things that will support us and help us grow um, and develop the, a spiritual the path, the Noble Eightfold Path. And this right livelihood, as I mentioned, that's the fifth aspect of the Noble Eightfold Path. So when we see that, we naturally we think, wow, this must be really important because why would the Buddha mention it? Out of eight factors, we have right view, we have uh, right intention, and we have right speech, right action, right livelihood, 
right mind, uh, right effort, right mindfulness, and right samadhi. So it's important, a very important part of our lives and our practice. But just on a lighter note, I was going to mention uh, Oscar Wilde's famous quote. You probably all know this one. I love work. I could watch it for hours. <laughs> I don't know if people think that. It's quite a good quote, isn't it? So, and uh, just on a lighter note too, I was going to mention Nasrudin because I always, uh, quite often mention Nasrudin stories. In fact, if I don't mention, people say, how come there was no Nasrudin story? But many of you, have heard, many of these stories you've heard before. One day, Nasrudin, a man saw Nasrudin and uh, Nasrudin had a lot of stubble. Hope I haven't got too much. And uh, this man said, how often do you shave? You know, how often do you shave? And Nasrudin said to him, 20 or 30 times a day. And the man said to him, you must be a freak. And he said, no, I'm a barber. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's, it's very true on another level too, you know, because people who, whose job is, uh, their job is something, then they're often, uh, you know, often not a good example of it. So we hear of mechanics that fix cars, but their cars are a real bomb. <laughs> because it's the last one that gets attention. And probably it's the same for Nasrudin being a barber. So, so right livelihood is very, uh, it's a very important part of our lives. And as I say, to integrate it. And it comes from an understanding of the Buddha's teaching because we realize, you know, with right view, this is the roadmap of uh, the insights that we need for uh, our lives, that there is a thing called karma. This is called cause and effect. And so, thou actions by body, speech, and mind will have results. And therefore, this also it means that when we're at work, this will be the case too. It's not 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 as if it gets suspended when we get to work. You know, <laughs> anything goes. So, as I say to people, this is a field where we can make a lot of positive karma or negative karma from our actions at work. And of course, you know, when we go to work. It's exactly the same in any other aspect of our life. We want our, uh, our time at work to be consistent with the values that we are pursuing. Of course, we're not going to be perfect. You know, it's like when we keep the precepts, people aren't perfect with it. It's a training rule. And this is the whole of the Buddha's teaching, really. It's a training rule, a guide for us. And it's up to us to do our best. You know, we won't be perfect. And oftentimes people want to be perfect, and of course that's not possible. And, uh, but we try and keep trying, so this is important. And then when we go to work too, it's very good if we have a very good attitude to, um, to support how we interact with our colleagues at work, the, the uh, clients or customers that we meet, if we're a teacher or a doctor, uh, patients or students that we meet, you know, and this is very much coming from the uh, aspect of right attitude, which is that we uh, do our best to have very positive, uh, loving kindness, compassion, uh, not wishing to harm others or ourselves, uh, and also this aspect of giving, giving to whatever we're doing. And this is a very important part because this, particularly this perception of giving, this dana in the Pali language, is a very important aspect of the whole Buddha's path. So in our occupations, in whatever way we're working, we're making a living, we're giving to that, the organization, maybe to other people, to customers, to uh, uh, patients, if they're doctors, and so on. But if we see that as a form of giving, it makes, it transforms that work in a big, big way. And this is what I say to people, you know, even being a parent, for instance, that is a big giving, that's big time, you know. You have to put your lives on hold many, many times, especially when they're young, the children. And that's a big gift we're giving. But so often we don't think of it like that. We don't realize that this is a gift we are giving. And we think, well, it's my job, you know, this is my duty, this is what's expected, I'm a parent, <laughs> I have to do this. But if we have that attitude of giving, of seeing it as a gift, then that transforms it into part of our spiritual practice and something that we will get more out of, actually. If we think we have to do something, 
it's a quite a different mindset from thinking, ah, this is a gift that I can give. And I know uh, in Sri Lanka there's a, a tea company, Dilma, and the CEO has that uh, um, saying that business is, an, is a matter of human service. And that's the same idea, really, of giving. I think that's a, a nice idea. I don't know how, how much they live up to it, but I hope they do. Because then it transforms what we're doing into something more than just you know, a job, more than just what we have to do to get by, to make a living. And so this is something, this developing the perception of giving is very useful in our lives. You know, I have it for myself, you know, as a, as a monk, as a, a teaching monk in the Buddhist tradition. You know, I feel I am giving what I can give. And of course, you know, the Buddha, I say the Buddha is the biggest giver because <laughs> he gave the teachings. He, he discovered them and then he made them known to us. And uh, this is a, probably the highest, it is, they would have said it's the highest gift. So when we, when we think of our lives in terms of, and our work in terms of being a gift, now that tra transforms it, I think. I think many people might think, wow. <laughs> I don't know, you know, they, if thinking of their work in terms of being a gift was probably quite, quite a different way of looking at it. And it's, it's a useful way of looking at it and something that will bring happiness because giving is a, um, is a condition for happiness, actually, as it is also for success. So I think everybody's had the experience when you go to a shop or somewhere, even when you go to a doctor or uh, anywhere, and the person you interact with is really friendly, really helpful, not pushy, <laughs> Uh, not trying to sell you something you don't want, uh, trying to be of help, give you all the choices that you need. And when you meet somebody like that, you really feel encouraged to, you know, maybe shop there. You feel like this is uh, something that you value and very helpful. And so these, the bringing this quality of giving to our work uh, can have that aspect that it really builds connections between people. And this is important for success. And of course the other aspects of um, the Noble Eightfold Path, and nearly all the Noble Eightfold Path comes into play actually when we're at work, when we're anywhere really. And the other one is very important one at work and in our lives is right speech. And this is, this is something that I spoke about before and I'll go into a little bit more detail because right speech is a big area for us. It's where most of the problems come from, I think. I don't think anybody would disagree with that one. <laughs> it starts with uh, wrong speech, and then uh, it can come, become wrong action too. So, and th so the aspects of uh, ethical conduct, right speech, and right action, I'll talk about a little bit more in more detail in a minute, because these are part of ethical behavior, how we interact with the world and uh, others, whether it be at work or at home, wherever we find us, at school, uh, anywhere. So they're important. And of course, the other aspect of, you know, uh, developing right livelihood is right effort. And this is that effort to check up in our minds. Is my mind going towards the negative or is it going towards the positive? If it's going towards the negative, can I <laughs> this is sometimes difficult, let go of it. So as I mentioned, right effort is, is recognising what state our mind is in, you know. And if it is in a negative state, you know, somebody's just said something or done something at work or wherever, then, and we see that there's a negative state of mind, to let go of that if, uh, as much as possible, not to carry it on, not to react from that negative state of mind. But more importantly, is to develop these positive states of mind and maintain them. Because when we do those, uh, when we do that, then uh, the negative states of mind don't get so much opportunity to come up. If we've got loving kindness in the mind, even if somebody says something really awful, we can uh, let go of it a lot easier. So this is uh, how we can prepare our minds, actually, is through right effort. And of course, the other thing we need to bring to our, our jobs, our occupations, our work, is this right mindfulness. So this mindfulness of what's going on 
And that's part of checking on the mind, the right effort, knowing what's happening in the mind, uh, whether it's positive or negative. It's also knowing what's happening around us, what I'm doing, how am I interacting with others, uh, that sort of awareness. So the, in general, you know, our livelihood, you know, when we're at work, it should be something, uh, our job should be something that doesn't harm ourselves or others. And this is uh, uh, the essence of ethical behaviour, really, is the harmlessness, harmlessness, a hinksika. And it's, it's something we can aim for. And I'll just mention what, how the Buddha described the uh, right effort, because it's always good to go to the teachings of the Buddha to check up what he said. And he said, what, what is right livelihood? There is the case where a disciple of the Noble Ones, having abandoned dishonest or wrong livelihood, keeps his life going with right livelihood. This is called right livelihood. So that's just giving up wrong livelihood. But what's wrong livelihood we'll find in a minute. And how is uh, right view, uh, this is how the other factors relate to uh, right livelihood. How is right view the forerunner? One discerns wrong livelihood as wrong livelihood and right livelihood as right livelihood. And what is wrong livelihood? That's more important. <laughs> and he says, scheming, persuading, hinting, belittling and pursuing gain with gain. This is wrong livelihood. So th this is a wrong livelihood in this case the Buddha is talking about is really deception, you know, deceiving others, maybe deceiving ourselves too, and not coming from the truth. Because in the end, any spiritual teaching, not only Buddhism, the premise it's based on is truth some understanding of truth. And this is so important with the Buddha's teaching, so that if we are pursuing truth, but we are, we are coming from deception, we're using lies, scheming, what does it say? Persuading, hinting, all these things, then uh, this is not consistent it, with the path, what our values, what we want to achieve. Because if we want to find the truth, we have to use the means we find it, have to be consistent with that effort, that goal of finding the truth. And the Buddha continues, uh, one tries to abandon wrong livelihood and to enter into right livelihood. So this is effort, this is one's right effort. One is mindful to abandon wrong livelihood and to enter and remain in right livelihood. This is one's mindfulness. Thus, these three qualities, right view, right effort, and right mindfulness, run and circle around right livelihood. So as I mentioned, I mentioned a few more before that, but the Buddha is highlighting the fact that where we're coming from, right view, is very important in for informing um, how we, uh, what sort of livelihood we undertake, and that effort to develop or uh, continue in um, a livelihood that's not harming ourselves or others and also being aware, mindful of what we're doing, what our livelihood, how it's affecting us and others. So as I mentioned, non-harming is the most important thing. So if people wonder, is my uh, occupation my livelihood? Does, is it right livelihood? You can always use that as a, uh, a measure for, the, for whether it is or not. Is it causing harm to myself or to others? And so very often it's not very, uh, not easy to see, not, e not e cut and dried, as they say. But the Buddha did say, and uh, for those who uh, uh, know the Buddha's teaching, they know he mentions that there are five types of occupations that he did not recommend, and they're obvious examples of harming um, others and in the process harming oneself because these occupations they create karma one's creating karma by um, undertaking them so they're pretty obvious ones really so trading in weapons you know it, these are uh, weapons to kill other people the Buddha said this was wrong livelihood and we can see in the world this is big industry <laughs> making making weapons is a big industry. 
and it's all aimed you know obviously the the uh, the aim is for killing and uh, destroying other people and these days it can be uh, it can take many forms of course because we have the all conventional weapons we have chemical weapons nuclear weapons there's so much and it's very interesting that the probably the largest part of most government's budgets what's it spent on weapons <laughs> weapons it's really it's really sad because what it indicates doesn't it is that there's a lot of fear it's, it's like a, a fear and then the other side of fear is often aggression you know because we say attack is the first is the best kind of defense and the second type of occupation the buddha was talking about is trade in living beings living being amazing terminology it's very very sort of um uh, scientific but also very open so this is particularly people isn't it and the, the Buddha was thinking uh, well maybe not at his time I was gonna say slavery but in his time slavery was probably common you know the idea of a person being a slave was probably accepted but uh, there are other things these days slavery isn't acceptable though it's still continuing in this world adoption scams I've got here refugees um, uh, you know, we have these uh, people trafficking with refugees and we so often we, a large number of them die either in trucks or in boats and, and this sort of thing. And uh, prostitution is here as well. But at the time of the Buddha, that was also, uh, um, uh, it's always existed. <laughs> it's always existed. And it's very interesting that some of the uh, Buddhist nuns were actually um, they call them courtesans, but this is very similar to prostitution. And they became completely enlightened. So it's, uh, they gave up their, their livelihood and became nuns. And the other um, aspect of trade in living beings, of course, is raising animals for slaughter. That's an interesting one, isn't it? And that would have been happening at the time of the Buddha as well, you know. So it's... Uh, and so that's the trafficking living beings. And then trades in meat, he said this was a uh, wrong livelihood too, you know, uh, killing animals for, for meat and then the production side of it as well. So this is, this is, uh, and then people often say, you know, was, uh, is, is uh, Buddhism, do you have to be a vegetarian to be a Buddhist? because you get that in Sri Lanka, actually quite a lot of people do say that or think that. And uh, of course that's not the case, but um, that, that the, uh, for a, a monk or a Buddhist monk or nun, they can accept meat provided that they, this, the animal, whether it be an animal or a fish, wasn't, they, know, they, don't, they know that it wasn't killed for them and they know that, that uh, they haven't heard from somebody else that this was killed for their meal and they don't suspect that this was particularly that animal was particularly killed for them so that idea of not um, deliberately encouraging people to kill animals for or to offer to the sangha to the monks and the nuns so it's very um, and it's very obvious that you know loving kindness and or, and the uh, the precept on uh, not killing uh, living beings is comes into play here very much so and we, we have that sort of kindness for for other beings and the next occupation the Buddha talked about is poisons so any form of poison and I presume this would include pesticides herbicides <laughs> and pest control and all chemical weapons those sorts of things we did have a, a man in WA he was a pest control man he was a Buddhist so, so that was how he was making his living. Interesting, isn't it? Because you're killing quite a few living beings at one go. And that was a real, you know, really difficult for him in many ways, you know. And uh, he would take the five precepts, but only when he wasn't, you know, working. You know, he would take the five precepts and have that intention. I think he gave it up eventually. I'm pretty sure he did. He was quite old. So it's, um, yeah, so it's one of those challenges. And the last one, which would be a big one here in Australia, is uh, uh, not having an occupation connected with alcohol and drugs um, is, is something the Buddha said was wrong livelihood. And 
you can see everywhere here there's quite a lot of livelihood going on about alcohol particularly and uh, drugs too. So the Buddha was mentioning these five, you know, that that's good if we're not involved in them. Trade in weapons, trade in living beings, trade in meat, uh, and trade in poisons and intoxicants. So that's, that's, uh, that was his guideline uh, for it. And uh, in other places he also mentions uh, m lending money for interest, you know, like banks do. <laughs> it's an interesting one. He considered that wrong livelihood. And there's another interesting one that he considered acting a wrong livelihood. That's quite quite an interesting one because at the time of the Buddha there was a monk, there was a man who came to him. He was an, an actor, quite a famous actor at the time, Venerable Teliputta. He became Tele, Venerable Teliputta. And he came to ask the Buddha, what are, what's the karmic consequence of my acting? You know, I've given a lot of people happiness by my he owned a, a travelling acting company. You know, they do all sorts of singing and dancing and probably f different types of feats of, you know, magic and things like that. And the Buddha said to him, don't ask, <laughs> don't ask. And he said, no, no, I really want to know. So he said, don't ask. And then he asked again. And the Buddha always had this standard that if asked three times, he would tell people, you know, what was the consequence. And he said, he said the consequence of you being an actor uh, and uh, what you have been doing will be that you'll be reborn in the laughing hell. <laughs> so it must be a place where people just laugh all the time and it gets really, really torturous. And it was interesting because it makes you wonder why you know, the Buddha would say that. And the, the way I see it would be that it's promoting delusion in a big way. It's promoting delusion. Even though sometimes it's, we're happy you know, uh, it's a happy delusion, people are quite happy with it, they're entertained, but sometimes they also, um, you know, feel very sad with it and so forth. So it's manipulating us. So that's an interesting one. And he said soldiers too were, it's wrong livelihood. But of course many people were soldiers, many of his um, uh, disciples probably, his lay disciples were soldiers or kings, you know, in charge of army, armies and so on. So he's very practical, you know. He's not excluding these people as being Bud from, from being Buddhists, just like that pest control person in WA. Not excluding them, but trying to encourage them to go towards a livelihood that is not harming others and not harming themselves in the, in the bargain as well. So another Nasrudin story about uh, livelihood and uh, that can... Uh, it's a little bit, it's in, sort of in keeping with it. And Nasrudin was writing a letter for one of the other villagers because he couldn't write. And Nasrudin was probably, ed well, he's educated. And uh, he wrote the letter and then the villagers said, could you read it back? And Nasrudin, he couldn't read it. <laughs> he couldn't read it. And the villagers said to him, who is going to read it if you can't? And <laughs> Nasrudin, being Nasrudin, said, that's not my problem. My job is to write the letter, not to read it. <laughs> and then the villagers said, anyway, it's not addressed to you. <laughs> so that's really noise, having a bit of a laugh. <laughs> Does make you wonder whether you could write, actually, doesn't it? <laughs> so the very important uh, guideline, as I mentioned, is not harming uh, oneself or others. That's the, uh, that, that is the criteria, but... We also, any, any occupation that leads us to break the precepts uh, mentioned in right speech and right livelihood, that would be considered um, wrong livelihood. So many, many um, uh, livelihoods, not in and of themselves a wrong livelihood, but maybe the way they're practised can give rise to a conflict between our values and uh, what is expected in that occupation. So... So, of course, the, the big one uh, of, is not, as I mentioned before, not killing is a, is a very important one in uh, the precepts, the first precept we took this morning, so the first precept. And I know, for instance, Ajahn Chah, a famous uh, meditation master in northeast Thailand, he used to encourage his dis disciples, some of them villagers, to not kill um, uh, uh, animals for their livelihood. Because in many ways, that's what they depended on, actually, to live. 
Uh, they even he had a saying, catch it in the morning, eat it in the evening. <laughs> and uh, so he would try to encourage them not to. In many ways, they didn't have many alternatives. And one way he did encourage them was to, for them to find something else they could do to make a livelihood. And I remember one man, I think he used to catch lizards and things like that, and uh, he encouraged him to find another livelihood and he took up selling matches, as I remember, selling matches. And when I was in Thailand in the uh, early 2000s, I heard the the, uh, abbot of that monastery, not far from where Ajahn Chah used to live, he was encouraging, he was the previous abbot actually, in encouraging the visit, the villagers to make cane things, things out of cane, because they obviously had the cane, the rattan, I think they call it, and as an alternative to, uh, you know, to make a living that didn't harm other other people. And you see this uh, in, uh, in Sri Lanka, you see it too, Villagers tend to specialise in different types of um, uh, livelihood, you know, selling wooden things and there's even one place where they sell inflatable things, <laughs> inflatable toys and whatnot. So this is a very important principle, not killing, to avoid that in our livelihood. And not stealing is, is another one that uh, um, is breaking the precepts if we are stealing. Now, stealing can be... Either, you know, we can think of it, can't we, in terms of stealing from our employee, employer, sorry, if we're an employee, or stealing from our clients or uh, even stealing from the government, that sort of thing. Because we hear of these, uh, um, t- uh, <laughs> recently we've heard, heard about these tax scams with these uh, bogus directors of companies. I think the companies are real, but the directors are, are just uh, people who'd uh, been taken taken advantage of. So so anything that really uh, con- is in conflict with, uh, is a form of stealing, is in conflict, of course, with the precept. And uh, we should be looking at to avoid that or to uh, change the situation if possible. And the third one of the, uh, the precepts that uh, is part of right action is no, uh, to avoid sexual misconduct. And in the work environment, of course, you know, this is a place that uh, this happens quite often, really, you know, because people work together and uh, they can uh, have close contact. So this intimacy can arise and often some of, the, some of these uh, activities that happen in work environments, happy hours, for instance, and so on, can lead to problems and office parties and those sorts of things. So this is a, another aspect. And of course, you know, these days with the Me Too campaign, Hash Me Too and all that, and sexual harassment and all those things, this is an aspect that we have to keep in mind in the work environment particularly, you know. So... And the other uh, aspect, as I mentioned, with uh, right speech, I was going to say, say a bit more about. Of course, you know, it has to. We have to avoid in our occupation, our livelihood, lying. Lying is is out and out <laughs> deception. But uh, also, speech that uh, is not divisive doesn't try to divide colleagues against colleagues. You, usually, we call that politicking, don't we? We call it politicking at work. And sometimes in work environments that can be the case, which is, um, you know, unfortunate and unpleasant, actually, unpleasant. And the the other uh, type of uh, wrong speech we can avoid is harsh speech, and and this is very important. So this is like insulting or abusive um, speech, you know, and hopefully at work... We don't, uh, we don't encounter that, where people are being aggressive and uh, um, dominating in their speech. But particularly, we shouldn't be like that. If we're a Buddhist, we try and avoid that. So that's, uh, that's good. And the other type of speech the Buddha inca- uh, discouraged was gossip. In a work environment, any environment really, it can do a lot of damage, you know. And oftentimes the gossip will not, won't be true. So it's very good to avoid uh, you know, gossip as much as possible, uh, you know, uh, and not to, having heard it, not to 
relay it to other people because it usually becomes like Chinese whispers too. It gets more and more distorted as time goes by. And so you often, you, I think many of you would probably think like I, I was thinking, well, what occupations would have to watch out for right speech? What occupations? I think Helen will know. <laughs> It's journalists, uh, uh, one journalist, uh, advertising, all these sorts of things, isn't it? You know, where the ethics are, are really important. You know, whether the, what they're uh, um, uh, writing, what they're presenting in uh, interviews, or um, uh, well, not so much in interviews, but in documentaries, that sort of thing, is actual fact, um, correct, true, correct, and um, and not distorting or deceiving the uh, people who are watching or listening to it. So those, those uh, precepts, the uh, right speech and the uh, right action, they are important for how we you know, choose our um, occupation or if we are in an occupation that has aspects of breaking these precepts, to do what we can to reduce that or if we think it's not possible then you know make decisions about changing. So there are also some uh, important things too that uh, about our livelihood that um, and these these follow on in a sense from the precepts, don't they? That it should be earned ethically. You know, it should be ethically earned. So it's not has to be legal <laughs> and uh, not not illegal. You know, from crime or anything like that from drugs, money laundering, whatever it is, various schemes. And one of the areas that uh, is, um, people bring up these days is ethical investment, isn't it? Ethical investment, because sometimes, you know, um, some of the investments that people make, they find out that it's, they're actually uh, they're lending money to uh, companies or ventures that are doing things that they wouldn't agree with, either damaging the environment or exploiting people, or you know, in terms of uh, maybe for work and so on, in in third world countries. So it has to be something that is uh, that's ethical, um, and to we do our best because oftentimes we we don't know, do we? We don't know if you know how they're using the the investment portfolio, as they call it, how they're using it. Um, but if we we can check up, and that's quite a um, a good thing to do. And this uh, brings me to another story of Nasruddin. This is a really bumper Nasruddin <laughs> session. <laughs> but Nasruddin, uh, he, uh, every day he was trading and he had his donkey and he was uh, um, going across the border every day with his donkey. And the customs officials were absolutely certain that he was smuggling. He was smug smuggling something. And they would check everything that he had on the donkey and you know, go through it. They thought, must be, what is he smuggling? And every day he would go, they couldn't find anything that, uh, you know, that was considered to be breaking the law, you know, that he was smuggling. And uh, many years later, one of these customs man, men uh, met Nasruddin in another country and uh, Nazarudin had done quite well <laughs> from his uh, smuggling. And he said, we, the customs man said to Nazarudin, we know you were smuggling, we're absolutely sure you were smuggling, but what were you smuggling? We could never find out. And he said, donkeys. <laughs> <laughs> it's quite great, isn't it? It's really good. <laughs> that was the last thing they thought of, the donkeys. <laughs> It's the only thing that was a common thing. They knew he was doing it, though. He was probably doing quite well. And so also, it's very important, as, as they mentioned in the quote, quotation from the Mangala Sutta, that it's a peaceful... Uh, we're, we're getting our uh, livelihood peacefully, not by means of you know, forcing people or violence. And that goes without saying, in a way. And that it's, we're acting honestly, not deceiving others as the, uh, the Mahamangala Sutta said, an honest or a, a, um, a peaceful occupation. And uh, so this, these are all aspects that we can take into consideration and for the livelihood we lead. 
and may be of interest to you to know for for monks and nuns, for instance, for us, running errands and messengers, they're supposed to be wrong livelihood, buying and selling, because monks and nuns, uh, Buddhist monks and nuns, don't use money. So this is a, a wrong for us to do. Um, and many people will know that in many Buddhist countries, monks and nuns are <laughs> using money. That's, not, that's quite common. And cheating with uh, false weights and measures. Astrology. This is another one. In, in, in Buddhist countries, who are the best astrologers? <laughs> the monks. <laughs> Usually the monks. It's quite interesting. What would the Buddha say about that? Wow. He, he probably wouldn't have been surprised, actually. <laughs> Matchmaking and acting as doctors. These are other, other aspects, too, of... Uh, that's not appropriate for a monk or a nun. And some of these things, you know, you can um, uh, can see that they maybe have some application, especially false weights and cheating. I mean, that's not good for anyone, is it? A businessman or a businesswoman, anybody to, to do those sorts of things. Um, they certainly, <laughs> the customers won't come back <laughs> if they find out. And... So these things are um, important for uh, for monks and nuns. We're also of another aspect of uh, the, what the Buddha recommended for monks and nuns is, and this is the same for all of us really, not to use trickery, misleading others. You know, and the example the Buddha gave was that, you know, perhaps in, suggesting that we have deep meditation, you know, these dhyanas or something, and we don't. Of course, you know, that sort of um, uh, trickery can also lead to um, the, the monk or nun who says that being ex sort of expelled from being a Buddhist monk or nun because that would be breaking one of the big rules, actually. And uh, the Buddha mentioned, you know, pleasing talk and ingratiating talk to the donors, too, he said, with a view to get something. This is scheming, really, isn't it, really? In hinting or insinuating or, or harassing how harassing donors, interesting. Um, so these are all things that monks and nuns, Buddhist monks and nuns, shouldn't pursue. But more importantly, I think, you know, um, the way we perform our duties, uh, our work, our livelihood, that is something that is part of right livelihood too. And uh, this is something that uh, is worth uh, uh, reflecting on because, of course, the way we you know, perform whatever we have to do at work should be coming from the values that we, we, we believe in, you know, coming from the precepts and uh, coming from honesty and uh, non-deceptiveness, non-harming. So, for instance, for our duties, uh, the, uh, the workers and presumably the bosses too, <laughs> should fulfil their duties by not idling away their time and claiming extra work, uh, claiming they've worked longer or pocketing the company's goods. And I think that's pretty obvious, isn't it, really? Because that is deceit, that's lying in one form or another. So, especially pocketing the goods, you know. And sometimes people will say, well, everybody does it. <laughs> and that, of course, is not necessarily the justification for doing anything, actually, not so. And of course, you know, the other aspect of a right livelihood at work, the way we conduct ourselves, is to treat each other with respect. You know, treat each other with respect and consideration um, with our colleagues, with our employer, with, if we are an employer, with employees and customers, as well. So this is an important aspect to bring to our working environment because we often say, you know, if you give respect, you'll receive respect too. So this is an important thing. And it's just being considerate of other people's feelings and uh, their abilities and so on. So this is also treating people with kindness and compassion. So coming from that right attitude that I mentioned beforehand. and. Uh, also, the, uh, one of the aspects for an employee is to give work that is uh, appropriate, to give work that's appropriate for the employees um, uh, within the scope of their abilities and uh, their experience and knowledge, and to pay them adequately. So this is all aspects of right livelihood at work. I've got another Nasruddin story. That's about uh, 
human resources, this one is about, but as Rudin one day, he had some very good news. He was a messenger, he was acting as a messenger, not, he wasn't a monk, so he was acting as a messenger, he was taking good news to the king, and uh, he knew that he would uh, get a reward from the king, because <laughs> the king would be very happy. And so, but the uh, chamberlain, this is like the king's secretary, he also knew that uh, when he heard the, what the news was, that he'd get a, a good reward. So he said, look, I'm only going to let you see the king if you give me 50% of the reward. 50%, it's quite a lot, isn't it? And, and Nazarene said, well, all right, that's okay. And so he went in and he told the king the good news. And the king was delighted. He said, what can I grant you? What reward would you like? And Nazarene, being Nazarene, said, 50 lashes, 50 <laughs> lashes. The king said, wow, that's an unusual request. <laughs> and so after, so the king said, yes, if you want that, yes. And so they got out, the, the person came out and gave him 25 lashes. He said, stop, stop. He said, bring in my partner to give him the other half of the reward. <laughs> so that was the chamberlain. So very... <laughs> That's written as always being amazing. So I'd just like to finish with, uh, you know, to emphasise that our livelihood, right livelihood, is important and how we uh, perform our duties, how we, how we are at work is important and to encourage everyone to integrate, you know, those values that we hold as Buddhists um, or good values, any religion, good values, in our work environment as well, not to let go of them and to see any uh, discrepancies or that we have or we feel d discomfort that we feel with the work environment, to work on it, to either improve it or if we find that we are in a very difficult work situation and we feel we cannot, you know, uh, continue to uh, work in that environment, then if it's a toxic sort of environment and you hear about these difficult a work environments and, and people do experience them. Uh, so then to make a decision or think about giving up that job and going to another job, a livelihood which is much more supportive of the values one um, uh, subscribes to. And also oftentimes because if, a, if some livelihood is a, if a job, an occupation is very um, negative, it's very likely we'll take it into our, the rest of our lives. We'll go home in bad moods. We will find it difficult to uh, maybe to let go of the, those, uh, those negative influences. And it will affect the whole of our lives and, as it were, make that toxic too. So we have to use our wisdom. It's always in Buddhism, it's wisdom that informs whatever we do, even with our faith or conviction confidence, it's wisdom we balance it with. With our giving, it's always wisdom that we balance it with. We give wisely. So it's with our occupation, we have to use our wisdom and just measure, you know, this is this of benefit to me? Is this of harm to me or not? Or is it of harm to others or both? And also, you know, the, see the results of our actions at work, of that occupation, that livelihood. It's a big area. It's a big area, actually. And oftentimes people think, well, this is not particularly part of the spiritual domain, don't they? They think, well, temple, work, two different compartments. But in actual fact, it's part of our practice and, then, and a, quite a difficult part of our practice because the people we meet at work, they may not have the values that we have. Uh, and so this is a challenge for us, actually, to, to sometimes people will be impressed by somebody that has good values and they will come across to them, especially if they've got loving kindness and they're, they're very uh, honest people and, and kind people. These, these qualities, wise people, will affect others and uh, earn their respect. So in some ways, too, we could perhaps even change culture of where we work as well, if, we're, if, if that's possible. So I'd like to finish there and if there are any uh, comments or questions, Please, uh, or uh, complaints, complaints. Yeah, please go ahead. This is where they say, too many Nazarudin stories. <laughs> but some of them are good, weren't they? Thank you, Venerable Ajahn, for such an uh, inspiring and beautiful talk. Um, 
I would just like to share uh, an anecdote because you were mentioning about monks being astrologers. Uh, you know, somebody was uh, wanting to know his future from Ajahn Chah because uh, obviously everybody knew that he's a great time master and he would be able to read into the future. And this guy had been contributing quite a, a bit to the charity and fundraising and stuff. So, and he keeps on going again and again. And finally, uh, Ajahn Chah relents and says, okay, I'll see your future. And this guy is delighted. Finally, the great meditation master is going to <laughs> tell him his future. So Ajahn Chah takes his own time reading his hand. And, oh, uh, <laughs> and after that, uh, um, he says uh, with a pause, your future, and man is looking at his face, all excited. Oh, yes, yes, your future. It's uncertain. <laughs> <laughs> so, I, so I really like that one. Um, the, yeah. other, the other thing is I just wanted to ask you a question. That's good. Um, uh, what are your views on killing insects and birds and like uh, when they're involved in spreading disease, epidemics, pandemics? You know, uh, like uh -huh. as a doctor, I was involved in you know, killing rats uh -huh. when there was a widespread plague in Delhi. <laughs> Yeah, Long back yeah. when I was an intern, mm. so and so on and so forth. You know, there are uh, insecticide sprays all over because malaria was a big epidemic and taking lives. Yes. You yeah. know, so what are your views on that? I think it has to be with with wisdom that we we uh, look at what uh, you know what we're doing. You know what we what we're doing, and uh, you know um, then I think we can act. And uh, I did hear you know um, even with Ajahn Chah, for instance. You know the when the uh, Huts. Some of the huts were being uh, eaten by uh, white ants, as they very often are in the tropics. He he said it was okay. He thought it was okay to use some insecticide. Whether he was thinking, you know, to create a barrier so they wouldn't come to it, I don't know. But so we have to use our wisdom, and if we can avoid it or find a way that uh, doesn't actually kill those uh, beings, of course that's the best, you know. And so it's often. The, the thing about uh, avoiding killing living beings is often it's uh, it's extra work for people, you know. And if they get out the spray and, you know, the insects have gone straight away. But if you have to sweep them out again and again and again, it gets very tiring. But I myself, I had that very often because I lived in a, uh, in a cave. It's a cave, a hut sort of thing in a cave under a rock. And, uh, you know, if I go, went away for two or three weeks, I come back and there'd be millions of ants. Oh, God. But fortunately they weren't, they, they call them uh, kalukumbi, they're black ants, but they, don't, they didn't bite very much, actually. Very occasionally they bite. But they got everywhere. They were in the bed, the mattress, and, and uh, you know, I remember on one occasion, or more than one probably, I had to sleep on the veranda because there was too many ants in the, in the hut. <laughs> And then, you know, I just sweep them out day, day after day. But, of course, even with the sweeping, I was killing them. You know, some of them, you know, weren't, weren't making it outside, you know. And so it's really difficult for us to avoid, you know, just living is, a, is an aspect that will lead to some beings dying. But you do your best, you know, and it's really the intention uh, not to harm them because even my understanding, I think it's the, the essence really of ethics, is even these small, very troublesome and irritating insects and uh, uh, maybe disease-spreading uh, insects, they want to live, you know, and if we can possibly, ma we can possibly manage that as well as achieve the objective of uh, reducing the harm from them, that's great, that's good. But life's always going to be a compromise. Thank you. Uh, Ajahn, the doctor of astrology. Uh, oh, astrology. <laughs> it's always a top, topic, <laughs> isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, many occasions, uh, through Venerable Ananda, uh, people ask Buddha what will happen to so and so after death, will yeah. be born here, born there, That's and where right. he come from. So uh, Buddha reluctantly, and sometimes he said that so and so will be born here, born there. So that's a form of astrology, I think. Yeah, that's <laughs> that's right. But the question of astrology is actually, right. yeah, you are talking about the future <laughs> happenings, uh, yeah. predicting. Well, it is all about uh, deceiving and lies, isn't it? I mean, they, they, it's all connected to deceiving people and telling lies mm. as mm. truth. That is the problem here. 
Yeah, it, it 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 may not be because sometimes I think the astrologers actually believe what they're saying. I'm, I'm, I, th I think you're right. Some cases they probably don't believe it, and there are people that do tend to have these psychic abilities sometimes. You know, so I think some some of them are genuinely believe what they're saying. Actually, so I, uh, I think that's not always the case. And with the Buddha, you know that story you're mentioning how when uh, Ananda would come to him and ask, you know. Well, has so and what happened to so and so after they passed away? And there were some very controversial ones because there was one man who was uh, he was a drinker. He was uh, Sarakani, I think Sarakani. Yeah, is that right, Sarakani? And uh, he passed away. And they asked asked the Buddha what was his destination? Where did he take rebirth? And and uh, he said he'd actually become the first stage of enlightenment, attained the first... He said, how is that possible? He was drinking <laughs> and all that. But he said, no, he had attained the first stage of enlightenment. And after quite a while, I don't know how long this happened, then Vinbananda would come and they say, the villagers are asking where so-and-so was reborn and as uh, Dr. Chai is mentioning. And eventually the Buddha got tired of it. <laughs> he said, this is not fitting. Said, We're probably taking a lot of time too, actually. And then he gave the mirror of the Dhamma, the talk about the mirror of the Dhamma. So he said, if somebody um, has this unwavering confidence in the Buddha, the Dhamma and the Sangha, if they have uh, their ethical behavior is really high standard, worthy of our, uh, noble ones, the Buddha said, um, then... And there's another one actually too. Uh, then you could say you can tell that this is a person that has attained some stage of enlightenment. But it's this very unwavering confidence in the Buddha, Dhamma, and Sangha, and uh, also this behaviour, the behaviour of body and speech is also really good. And uh, so this is because a person has attained the first stage of enlightenment. When by doing that, they realise, yeah. The Buddha must be enlightened, <laughs> because I've seen what he's, he was talking about. The Dhamma must be true. I've seen it, and so and uh, these other other uh, people, the Sangha, who have realised it. Yes, it's they they must have, because I have now realised it. So they know beyond a doubt. So this is what we call purifying the view. We call it purifying the view, and uh, also because of that they realise the importance of karma to, you know, the actions of body and speech and mind. And so this is what the Buddha gave as a mirror of the Dhamma. He said, don't ask me all the time. Just, <laughs> just you can tell, you know, of course, if somebody's been reborn, you don't know where they've been reborn. But if people want to know the attainments of people, he said, this is how you can tell. You don't have to ask me. <laughs> so, good. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Chai. Yes, astrology is always a, is a biggie, actually. It's, it's, it's amazing. Yes, I think that's... Any, this, We've this got a few questions? online questions. Oh, really? Oh, all right. Yes, we're just, just seeing. Yes, just see if there's... Because livelihood's an important area. Most people don't think of it as part of their practice, do we? We think, oh, no, that's work. <laughs> it's like another, another world. So Bhante, here's a question. Mm. Many companies benefit some and harm others at the same mm, time. It's true. Selling soccer balls made by children, how do I deal with my guilt of harming others by doing what I'm good as an employee? What was that? What was the I think he said, how do I deal with my guilt of harming others yeah. um, while doing what I am good at as an employee? Yeah, what's, did they say what they're good at? No, he didn't. Ah, oh, right. Yeah, right. but it seems just to indicate that he's he's loving. doing some yeah. some work which may he feels is is yeah. in conflict. At, um, he said, yeah, he said conflict. examples selling soccer balls made by children. Oh, right, right. I thought I heard soccer balls. I thought yes, yes, yes. That's true, you know. And uh, sometimes we don't know, you know, what conditions the uh, the uh, products that we're selling or that we're buying as consumers, uh, where, how they've been produced. And if it's, you know, through child, uh, child labour, that's uh, something that we, we, can, we wouldn't want to encourage. We wouldn't want to encourage. So, you know, in those cases, you do your best. And, you know, you also, um, you know, it's, it's not an easy situation because, you know, even though you say, you know, well, child labour is obviously not something to be encouraged, but they maybe they don't have anything to eat. <laughs> 
you know. Um, so I think in those cases you try to steer towards a more ethical choice. You know, obviously, um, often the reason that something will be cheaper is because, is because it's been produced by exploiting somebody else, which is awful, isn't it, really? Um, so I think, you know, if we're going to act ethically and we're aware of it, I think we can look into it and then we try and find another supplier if possible. Or, you know, and, and you can't do it in... Um, uh, it's not with probably within most people's area of influence to somehow help the children that are being exploited, you know, help that situation to be avoided. But that's often beyond our scope. Yeah, thank you for that. Yes, yeah, it's a difficult life. Is a, is a, you know, uh, there are many conflicts in in uh, um, in our, our lives that we have to sort of balance and use wisdom. Mm, thank you. Yes. Do you still have time for any more questions? Yes, just uh, one more, maybe. Okay. There. This is from a 16-year-old boy from the UK. Uh -huh. He's he's a, a Sikh person. Yeah. And. Mm. Uh, his religion is Sikh, and mm. he's uh, also studying Buddhism cool. at A-level. So his question was, mm. um, what is your view on Sikhism? I'm a Sikh, and Sikhism has very similar concepts to Buddhism. Right. I, I don't really know enough about Sikhism, actually, to be honest. I know the turban and <laughs> the beard and all that sort of thing. So... No, I, I couldn't really comment on that, actually, because uh, I don't know enough. But I think most religions, you know, the core of them uh, is towards good ethics, um, is important um, uh, towards uh, generosity, these sorts of things, uh, to positive behaviour. And some of them encourage, um, uh, certainly all of them would encourage wisdom, and some will encourage uh, developing the mind, you know, like Buddhism does with meditation. Maybe Sikhism does too. Yes, Helen. Yeah. Yes. Weeks. Yes. That was just in case you didn't hear that, it, uh, Helen was just saying that the Sikh community was very good in responding to the bushfires we had here in Australia, which were uh, overwhelming, really huge, vast. And uh, in East Gippsland, the Sikh community from Melbourne went and they set up um, food stalls and fed the uh, uh, firefighters for weeks on end. And they were very, one of the first groups I heard that went there. They just, you know, they just took everything and uh, went, to, went to East Gippsland to, to provide food for those fighting for the fires. So that was really, so that's very good. So that's a wonderful thing to do. Marvellous sadhu. So that's good. So there we are. Thank you for that, Alan. That's very good, good to mention. So now we have the next door, we have the shared meal. So those who would like to come for the shared meal, you're all invited. You're all invited. And for those who would like to, we can pay respects to the Buddha, Dhamma and Sangha. And good luck, good luck with your jobs. <laughs>